The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Hey, hey! Special bonus episode number one this month, October the 2nd. It's a Saturday. 31 shows in 31 days in the month of October. We are striving for it, and damn it, I think I can do it. I can certainly do it the first two days. We'll also have another bonus episode for you tomorrow, and I'm really excited about just the opportunity to cover stuff every single day. Honestly, if I could do it during the season, I would, but it's just too hard. The voice needs a breather. Uh, Being so locked into Twitter every moment needs a breather, but right now... This is when we are. I mean, there's no break at all in the mayhem. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. I'm going to find a ton of enthusiasm here in talking to all of these pros and then other things going on. Today on Fantasy NBA Today, we're going to talk to Brandon Marcus in about two minutes. I want to dive right into the good stuff here. But first, I promised you guys at the beginning of every episode, I was going to break down one fantasy player before we got into any promo or any guest stuff. We started with OG Ananobi, and today I'm going to go the other direction with Rudy Gobert, who I think, very quickly, I'm becoming the Rudy Gobert guy in the fantasy community. And it's strange because of how often I talk about how much I hate the free throw guys, the dudes that tank your free throw percent, And Gobert is very much one of them. He's like one of the five worst free throw shooters in the NBA. Not so much because his 62, 63% is the worst number, but he's doing it on five plus per ball game. And that's damn hard to come back from. Thing is, the other free throw guys, the ones that I really dig into, the ones that I I loathe are like Giannis, uh, Luca, who, by the way, isn't as much of a negative as Gobert. In fact, it's not even all that close, but Giannis is actually worse. The reason I clobber those guys is because they're first-rounders. And if you look at the first-rounders on an annual basis, and certainly this most recent year, there was really only one guy who had a per-game production level inside the top uh, 12. And if you pull out Karai Thomas then I guess it's really the top 11. But those names, the guys who had first round per game value this last year, Nikola Jokic, Steph Curry, Kyrie Irving, Kawhi Leonard, Jimmy Butler, Joel Embiid, James Harden, Kevin Durant, Dame, Vooch, and Cat. Every single one of those guys that I just read off was a medium to large positive free throw impact guy. So the reason I think that I'm becoming the Rudy Gobert guy is because, one, nobody believes that he can stay healthy another year, but he's done it now a couple seasons in a row. And two, people don't like the fact that he only scores 14 points per game. They feel like rebounds you can find elsewhere. By the way, I don't actually think that's true. Rebounds are are actually one of those categories where they really are like a a handful of hyper-elite guys, and Gobert is one of them, along with Clint Capella. 2.7 blocks per game. That's colossal. That's not quite Miles Turner level, but I believe Rudy was second in the NBA in block shots last year. And then the really good field goal percent. So he's actually, like, he's really good in two of my four favorite categories. He's quite bad in one of them. But again, the reason why this is doable is that hopefully you're going into Gobert with a very good foul shooter already in the chamber, so to speak where if you have a pick towards the end of the first round, you probably are going to have someone much better to grab coming back in the second round. I'm not advocating you go take Gobert at, like, pick 15. The reason I keep ending up with Rudy on mock draft teams and talking about him on Twitter so much, and I'll give you guys the promo on that in a minute, is because he's going in the late 20s. And, you know, they're talking early third round there, or if you wanted to go a little early, you could go late second. That's a guy that's pairing now with one of the top, generally, three or four picks in fantasy. So Jokic, Curry, in some leagues it's Luka and Zion, and so at that point you're punting. But in other spots, Harden, KD, Dame, those guys are all going in the top five or six picks. And Jokic 
you know, 87% five and a half free throws per game. That's like one of the bad ones in that group. Steph almost cancels out Gobert's negative by himself. Dame basically does cancel out Gobert's negative by himself. So all of a sudden, you're only middle of the pack in one category. But in terms of this concept of pairing, which I'm not a massive fan of, it fits there. Like if you have Steph and you go bear and, and people are like, why would you do go bear? You ruin one of Steph's best categories, which is free throw shooting. Yes, but you also cover the only th- uh, two really, or three if you want to add field goal percent categories that Steph isn't excellent in. You could use a little assist boost there. Or if you had Dame, you assist are a little bit better, but the field goal percent is a little bit worse. Steals are a tiny bit lower. So it's a great pairing, and then you just have to focus in the third round or the fourth round on a medium positive free throw guy. They're out there. DeMar DeRozan, if you wanted to go like fifth round, Tobias Harris was solid, Zach Levine, if you ended up with him, he's probably going a little bit too early this year. So they're out there. They're available. Chris Middleton, good foul shooter. Donovan Mitchell, Brandon Ingram, now suddenly a really good foul shooter. Kyle Lowry, Kemba Walker. This is all it takes. Norman Powell, if you want to go farther down the board. Jeremy Grant, if you want to go farther down the board. They're out there. And then you just need to avoid any other full tank free throw guys. Because the rest of the bucket in free throw is fairly league averagey. A lot of the guys drafted between 25 and the end of your fantasy draft are just average in foul shooting. You know, they're somewhere between 78 and 84 percent on low-ish volume. They're just average, or they're high volume, but they're like right at 80 80 percent, which is kind of where you need to be 79, 80 percent to be okay in foul shooting. But if you take one more good foul shooter. You know, Chris Paul is actually an interesting example of that. Going in the third round, positive free throw percent guy. They're out there. It just takes one more on top of whatever that guy was I just talked about, whether, you know, it was Harden in the first or Dame or Steph or Jokic or whatever. One more good foul shooter, and you've basically canceled out the Gobert negative. With Rudy, you're probably not going to win free throw percent. That's true. But you have a very good chance to win rebounding blocks. Your field goal percent is going to be excellent. He's a bigger positive impact guy there than anybody in the first round is a negative field goal percent dude. And so, again, there's a reasonable build. At the end of the day, the short version, that was a very long explanation for a very short answer. The short answer is he's being underdrafted. He was a first rounder by totals last year. And it really wasn't all that close because of how durable he was. His block ability is, uh, is just obscene. And he's getting drafted, even on a per-game basis, a half round to a round back of where his per-game marks were last season. And by totals, like two and a half rounds too late compared to last year. Now, I don't know how this, hell, how this happened. He wasn't going to be the guy. I think I did mention in May that I thought he might fall into kind of the Dan Vespers old man squad bucket. But he might end up being the big French silhouette that's the logo this year. It might not be Tobias anymore. Maybe it will. Could be. Why, would, why would you change the logo when the logo is so good? It's probably still Tobias, but you guys catch my meaning. So there's, everybody talks, I, I mean, I do a lot of this curmudgeonly stuff on the podcast, but I wanted to give you guys someone that I would actually like pretty bullish on, not because there's any excitement at all. You know the Dan Vespers teams are not going to be even the tiniest bit exciting, but damn it, they're going to beat their ADPs. And so today, we give you a positive note on Rudy Gobert. Welcome to the show, everybody. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation, our first Saturday bonus show in the month of October. I'm your host, Dan Bespris. Please do follow me on Twitter, at Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S, or just Google search Dan from Hoop Ball. Please take a moment here at the beginning of the show to listen to my rapid-fire things going on. One thing going on. Hoop Ball Leagues. Drafts start in one week from today. We are in waitlist mode now. So if you want to join a Hoop Ball League, you got to hit me up quick. You can do that on Twitter, as I just mentioned, at Dan Bespris, or email teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. A lot of you guys hit me up about recruiting pitch. Not as many DFSers, which is probably because 
this is not a show for DFSers, but we're looking for fantasy writers on the full season and DFS side. Please do bug me at Dan Bespers on Twitter or email that same one, teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. Also, by the way, we're looking for uh, team coverage podcasters as well. We have about half the teams in the NBA with podcasts. If you didn't know we had that, please do check those out. Those guys are busting their humps, but like, uh, we have a lot of really good teams that aren't claimed yet. Golden State Warriors, the Knicks don't have a podcast. That seems insane. Suns, they nearly won the championship. Trailblazers, I'd love to do a Blazers pod if I had the time. So bug me if you have a favorite team or you just, you know, you want to get in on that side. It's an opportunity to climb the ladder and shout out again to our buddies, uh, David and Isaac over on the Grizzlies show that they've used their podcast and networking and they're now like they're part of legitimate media covering the Grizz. And that could be you. Do You want to cover a team? We've done it here at HoopBall. And of course, Brewski and the Kings. But I mean, that sort of goes without saying. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to mention, please do hit that subscribe button. It's such a big deal. If you like this show, drop a five-star review. But more than anything, you hit subscribe. We move up the boards. More people find us. More people hit subscribe. Positive feedback loop. Dan smiles. Everybody's happy. It's not a Wednesday, but happy Brandon Day. Happy Brandon Day. Oh, it's been a while since I've been able to say that. It feels so good. It feels so good. It's like eight months, I think. I was looking at the last time we had a Skype call, and it was in February. <laughs> You've had a few things change since then. Yeah, got a child. <laughs> Progeny. Congratulations, yeah. man. I haven't been able to say that on air to you. Ah, uh, thank you. Yes, got a house, got a child. It's it's uh, oh it's my all god, and Brandon, right now, dude. You you got so much older in the last eight months. It's just outstanding. Welcome. Yeah. So, are you as grumpy as I am? Are you that old yet? No, I'm not as grumpy as you are. It's, it, <laughs> we were talking about this before we recorded. You're like, ah, you're just as grumpy as I am. Like, I don't think that's a good thing. That's a great like, thing. <laughs> that's a wonderful thing. We all love to. I have a lovely park bench that gets a great view of clouds, and you can just yell at them all day. It's wonderful. I'm just, dude, I'm so excited to have you back on the show. I First of all, you and I go way back. But also, I just love having fellow uh, broadcasters on the show because I get to do so much less work. So that's another awesome thing. But uh, Brandon Marcus, by the way, is our guest today for this special Saturday edition of Fantasy NBA Today. Welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Dan Bespris. You can follow the two of us at Dan Bespris on Twitter or just Google Dan from Hoopball. Brandon is at BD Marcus on Twitter. Uh, we used to do a thing where we ran through buy lows and sell highs on Wednesdays, and then schedules changed. You had to work in the middle of the day, and then my schedule changed, and I didn't have coverage in the middle of the day. But we found this weird pocket to record on a Friday for... And it worked out great, because I'm trying to do a show every day in October, and so the schedules finally aligned. And then we got on this phone call, and you told me you had actually already done homework for the podcast. And I'm like, all right, am I even needed anymore? What do you want to talk about, man? You did the work, so you, you should steer away. the ship. Yeah, you can go away. It's good. I, I'm <laughs> the captain now. Yeah, oh, <laughs> thank you. My Tom Hanks, I can just go chill out to the side here. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, just, well, it feels, first of all, it feels great to be back. I, I'm just happy that I'm here and that we're talking fantasy basketball I can't believe the season's already here. It feels like it, it just ended. It did, by the way. Yeah, it re- yeah, it did, right? It's, yeah. It feels like I was just talking Clippers, and all of a sudden we got the season that is right before we know it, and it's crazy. But- okay, wait a minute. I know I said you were the captain, but I actually want to talk about what you just brought up because I've been having this weird mental fight on how we got to this weird point because it is a, a slightly shorter off season. where last off season there just wasn't one. It was like finals, okay, training camp. This time it was just one month less than a normal off season, but because it was like playoffs, finals, draft, uh, free agency, summer league, all back to back to back to back to back, and then there was this weird lull that happened in September. The lull never happens in September. The lull happens in August most of the time, and so we got kind of towards the end of this last month because now we're into October and people weren't ready to pay attention to basketball yet as recently as like two weeks ago. And I'm here, I'm here on this podcast yelling at everybody like, where the hell are you knocking on doors? Because we're four weeks from the start of the season. Now you're starting to see people come back in. Have you had that same 
feeling of like, when do I get my break? Fine, I'm just going to take it now. And then also, has that created kind of a weird situation where analysts don't agree on anything this year? Yeah, it's interesting because I've been following your uh, your tweet storms and your random tweets about the upcoming season and people arguing about the first couple rounds. And it, you and I are different in that regard where I'm actually an auction guy. And so anybody that's listening, feel free to hit me up on Twitter at BD Marcus. You have auction questions. Yes, please, please. It, it's very different because you're talking about the first six picks and first 12 picks. And it's still relevant for people that are doing auction because you have an idea of who's going to go for the most money or who should go for the most money. And, and it made me go back to my team and see who I actually had. And it's a keeper league, so I get two keepers. So I'll try and see who would be a keeper. And, and for example, Jason Tatum, I kept last year, and I have one more year of him. Got him at 24. So I get him at 30 this year. And that's certainly a guy that I'm going to keep because, as you have been saying, that that's a first-rounder. That, that's a top mm-hmm. eight, nine guy right there. And to get him only for 30 in a $200 auction league is great. And so I've kind of been st- staying away for the last couple of months about fantasy basketball. And then all of a sudden it feels like media days is what really drew me in most recently because we finally have news because everything else was just speculation. It it was speculation. Who's starting, who's healthy, who's not, who is going to be the the main guy is Kelly Olynyk going to actually get playing time. Is he actually going to be the main guy? (laughs) Thanks for bringing up. Thanks for bringing up my boy, Kelly. (laughs) Oh, we just didn't have much information. And now we finally do. And it's allowed me to write stuff down and to start getting ready. And uh, the commissioner of my league reactivated the league on Yahoo. And so now we're, we're ready to go. I mean, the draft for us, I believe, is in 16 days. So before you know it, which means that now is the time to really get into it. Yeah, I have some drafts that are coming up in nine days. I actually have a league with a draft in nine days where someone just backed out. Like, that's, that's how late people are realizing that, that basketball is coming up. Okay, now officially... Here, take the wheel of the ship. Where do you want to go first? I figure uh, you probably got some dudes you either really don't like or dudes you really do. Both. I, I have both. I, I have been putting together a list this entire week of guys that are injured. And as you always say, you don't like touching guys that are hurt. And we always we are on the same page with that, where I don't want to draft a guy that is going to be missing the first couple weeks because, A, you get re-injured later on. And B, the timetable could get pushed back. And so you think you're going to have a guy in two weeks, but it turns out he's missing six weeks. He's missing eight weeks. And it just is not what you want, especially when you are going to draft someone high. So I've been dra- I've been listing that. And I've also been listening who is and who is not vaccinated. And I'm doing that for a couple of reasons. First, if you've been following New York and California, the Warriors – and the Nets, of course, Kyrie and Wiggins, those guys cannot play home games. That's really relevant. Yeah, I big mean, time. It's extremely relevant. And then you look at guys who are not vaccinated that could be subject to stricter protocols. And we saw last year the guys that all of a sudden are ruled out last second. And it affects you a little bit less in the games cap leagues. But for me, I'm in a head to head in a daily drop league where it affects you big time. If a guy is going to miss two weeks because he's got to be out because he's got COVID, then it's important. And a guy like Bradley Beal, for example, is someone that A, could get COVID. B, is someone that when he's got a someone close to his inner circle that's got COVID, he's going to probably have to isolate. And so you're not only getting these guys that have COVID, but also when they get proximity to people who do have COVID. And so it's just... It's difficult when you're trying to juggle, okay, do I want Bradley Beal or do I want, I don't know, a Damian Lillard or do you want a Nikola Vucevic? You use those types of things that separate one guy from another. Let me, okay, so I have some follow-ups on that and I I like the way you put it too because, you know, I had someone and, and he ended up being mostly a Twitter troll when all said and done was like, why do you guys need to know this stuff? Like, well, this is why. This is the answer to why. Whether or not, and I've said this, I think it was on Monday's pod, I sort of like did the, the, the tightrope act as best I could. Everybody knows how I feel about this stuff. But just from a fantasy standpoint, you need to know. If you didn't know that Kyrie wasn't going to be allowed to play potentially in, in 43 of his games this year, because the Knicks games uh, just across, I guess that's what, across the bridge, he wouldn't be able to play in those either. This is relevant. Now, 
For Wiggins and Kyrie, the answer is very simple. You pretty much can't touch them until we know what's going on unless you have like the biggest stones on planet Earth. And certainly for someone like Kyrie, you know, he's he was a top five per game guy last year. So there's a little bit more of an upside play there if you took that plunge at I don't know. Is there any point at which because again, this is like would you draft an injured player? Is there any point at which you would take Kyrie Irving? Because I think I probably would draft him if he fell past 50. Interesting question, and it's a relevant one, and I'm glad you're asking me because I actually had Kyrie last year. And it was a question of how little would he go for and how high would I be willing to go? And I got him for 30 last year. And and just for comparison's sake, Giannis went for 62 and Hmm. Damian Lillard went for 55. So that's just to compare about how I got Kyrie on the cheap. And yeah, because... that's a good. I think that's a good value on him. And I'm not yeah. a big auction guy, but just from a like how much you spent standpoint, comparing to Giannis, he was better than Giannis last year by by yeah. averages, and they were pretty damn close by totals. Yeah, exactly. And Aiton went for 28. John Morant went for 38. So mm. y- you get a guy like Kyrie that is going to be incredible for you when he's playing, and that's phenomenal. But now. I think I would probably go 15 or less for him because Mm. you look at your budget and you're saying how much of your budget are you willing to throw away for half the season of a guy that's not going to play. And that's also, by the way, not factoring in the home games that he's going to miss or the away games he's going to miss because of injury or because of back-to-backs. And so it probably would be 15 or less because I don't think I'm willing to go more than I, I would say 8% of my budget on a guy like Kyrie that's I'm not going to be able to count on for very long. I wouldn't draft Andrew Wiggins under any circumstance, would you? Me too. No, yeah. I would not. Because he doesn't have the Kyrie first round upside. That's the that's uh, the allure. Um, and, and last year he was, I believe, 88 in per game. So And, and he had some crazy stat lines. I mean, he was pretty good. 18 and a half points per game. He had two threes per game, five rebounds. He had a, a stretch where he was getting blocks left and right, ended up with one steal and one block per game, 48% shooting. So he had a great year last year. But let's also remember that Clay's going to come back this year, and that's going to eat into his usage big time. So I, I would not draft Andrew Wiggins. I do wonder, and you know, I don't want to get too far down this path, but I do wonder if, if the NBA and the cities find some sort of common ground here in the next two and a half weeks. It's hard to know. We, we're not... We're not privy to whatever's going on behind the scenes. Now, uh, guys like Beal, Michael Porter Jr., Jonathan Isaac, yes, they do all fall into sort of different buckets. Although Beal and and MPJ, Beal's been getting drafted in kind of like the 11 to 14 range. Michael Porter Jr. closer to that like 18 to 24 area. So not that far apart. They are in cities where there aren't any kind of mandates. So this then draws back to more what you were talking about in terms of protocol we don't again it's 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 a little bit of a guessing game other than just knowing the nba has come out and said like these are the more stringent measures that those who choose to be unvaccinated are going to be following they have to stay in hotels when they're on the road they can't go out and do stuff if they are exposed like you said to someone in their inner circle they have to quarantine for five to seven days that stuff just means that a missed game is more likely again whether or not you agree with their stance they are more likely to have missed games for this. My question for you then becomes, how much of an adjustment do you make? Because I actually, again, this is this is snake draft style. I don't move those guys very much for a couple of reasons. One, uh, Michael Porter Jr., I believe, has had it twice. Yes. And so that that does actually make a third infection somewhat unlikely. But the protocol stuff is still in effect, even though he has had it twice. That's just the way the rules are. Uh, and the fact that most of the NBA is vaccinated, if they really are being like locked in their hotel rooms, I think you only have to worry about the inner circle protocol stuff, really. I mean, like the odds of an infection are not that much higher for those guys. Maybe somewhat, yeah. But how much do you move them down your board? Because for me, it's very, very little. Well, and also you got to consider that they have to actually follow those guidelines. I mean, it's true. Just look at true. the example like Porzingis last year that I believe was caught in a club. Um, and he was given the okay. But a guy like Michael Porter Jr., if that happens to him, he's probably sitting for five to seven days. And so you make that mistake, and you're going to get caught. So they have to follow the protocols. I mean, first of all, you mentioned Isaac. I'm not touching him anyways. Um, I was really excited to draft him, 
and then the fact that he's still not healthy yeah, and good point. no timetable for his return, that's a stay away from me. I was stoked to draft him this year, but not happening. Um, you combine, the obviously, the COVID stuff, and it just doesn't make sense to me um, with the fact not vaccinated, plus, more importantly, the fact that he's not ready. And to answer your question, I, I don't think I would um, – knock him down that much however it, it does worry me in Beal's um area that he may get shut down again late in the season so that's something that concerns me a little bit he was very good there's no doubt about it last year he was close to a first rounder so I would probably take him close to the turn and, and probably in the second round uh, Michael Porter Jr. is a guy that I don't know I don't think I'm as high on him as other people are. There's just something about him that doesn't scream like he's going to be incredible. And the back thing still concerns me a little bit um, because that could certainly be there. I mean, he was great, obviously, in the bubble. And then he was a mess um, in 2019-20 overall. But I'm staying away from him probably in general. I'm not drafting him. But in to answer your question, probably... I don't know, late third, early fourth. Yeah, so I'm. I look at a guy like Porter, and I, I think you you bring up a better point, which is that the vaccination stuff is not really the reason why I probably don't end up with him in a lot of places. Just like you, I think he's probably one of those hype train guys. That's probably yeah. the bigger issue at play is that he just keeps getting pushed higher. He like he was getting drafted in the 30s, and then it was the early 30s, and then it was the late 20s, and then all of a sudden he's going at like 19. I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess he was like kind of near that actually after Jamal Murray went down last year, and that's basically what he's stepping back into. But also, can he really shoot 55% from the field with three three-pointers per game again this year? Is that is that repeatable? It might be. Maybe, maybe he really is like one of the best offensive players in the NBA, and maybe he solidifies that. But also, that's freaking crazy. There aren't guys that hit three three-pointers a game that shoot 55% from the field. The guys shooting 55% are really big dudes, <laughs> generally. So it is possible Michael Porter Jr. might be the freak of nature that becomes that offensive guy, and if so, then maybe he does hit that 20 mark. But it does also feel like some of his stuff might kind of come back down to earth a little bit. So uh, forgetting all the other stuff we've talked about, just the hype train issue becomes maybe the uh, the bigger piece of that puzzle. I think we did a pretty good job of talking about this without ruffling any feathers, don't you? Yes, and to add one more point, Michael Porter Jr. went from 1.13s per game to 2.83s per game and field goal percentage of 50.9 to 54 point, or 50.2, no, 50.9 to 54.2. So that those are big jumps. Um, I, I'm not sure it's sustainable. And also... There's the fact that there was times when he only played like 20 minutes because he wasn't great defensively and he was benched. And so I don't know. It feels like his playing time could get jerked around a little bit where I don't really want a guy that I'm taking in the first couple rounds for that to be the case. So, again, that's another reason why I'm staying away. There's too much in the past where Michael Malone has been like, eh, I'm not going to play you very much. He'll probably be forced to because I know Murray. But still, I don't know. Listen and, and to so oh, sorry, go ahead. I could affect the back. I, it just it worries me. So uh, listen to this ridiculous stat line that he put up. The last twenty five games he played last year, he averaged twenty three point seven boards. That's fine. That's like not eye popping, but very good. Three point three threes on fifty six percent from the field and eighty four percent at the free throw line. He's not going to be a big steals or blocks guy, which kind of means that the field goal percent. That actually was his biggest positive impact category during that run last year. So if that trails off in any meaningful way, by the way, he was number 18 in the entire NBA over that stretch. I don't know how it gets better from there. I just feel like I actually really like his fantasy game. You and I disagree a bit on this. I like Michael Porter Jr. a lot. I just think he's been priced out now. And like I wanted to, I wanted to go get him at 30, but middle of the second round you've got guys in there that have like proven themselves to be mid second round or better per game guys that don't have this weird like will this number stick element to their game uh but it's good it's it's interesting that you and i almost ended up we ended up at the same answer 
two very different ways on him. And that's kind of cool. And that's actually one of the other things you mentioned that I wanted to bring up. We agree about the injury stuff. You and I actually disagree on a lot on fantasy, which is part of why I really liked Brandon Day in the past, is that we don't just say the same thing over and over again. Um, who are some of the... Uh, I, listen, I, I almost took the wheel back from you here. Where do you want to go next? No, go ahead. Feel free. Continue on. <laughs> that was it. Where do you want to go next? <laughs> no, you, no, you started. You're saying who are some of the guys that I'm high on? Is that where we're going right now? I don't know. Do you have other lows or do you have some highs? Where do you want to head? Um, I think that's okay. I mean, just some guys that I wrote down, by the way, of do not drafts because of injury. Siakam. Yep. Um, someone, TJ Warren, is yep. another. Um, I bit that bullet last year, and I'm not going there again. Um, Zion is another. Foot injuries. That, that no thank you. Um, and then, yeah, those are the other guys we talked about. So those are the guys that I'm probably not drafting. I'm assuming you agree with me on those. 100%. The one I'm on the fence with is is Chris Paul. It sounds like he's ready to go at the start of the season, despite the wrist stuff. Um, he's been a weird one for me because I had no intention of drafting him this year. I figured this was going to be the season that fantasy adjusted to how good he's been the last two years now. And uh, it still hasn't. He's still going in the mid to late 30s. And so now I'm still ending up with Chris Paul, despite not like the last two years, I targeted him. He was the guy I wanted in the third round everywhere. I had him, I think, on five of my six cash leagues last year. And this year, I have no intention. I'm probably going to have him on five of six cash leagues again. What do you what are your feelings on Chris Paul before we move on to guys you're targeting? It's always the worry about health, but at the same time, it's funny because he has made a concentrated effort to change his diet, and because of that, we've seen the results of him staying healthy and playing games. I mean, he played 70 games in 2019-20, and then he played 70 again last year. It's so crazy. if you can get 70 games from him at the level that he's been playing, no doubt about it. I mean, just the per game, and usually you'll see a major drop-off and start to notice, okay, this is the year. But he's gone from 6 to 8 to 9 to 21 to 14 to 18. Yeah. So he's a safe top 30 guy. It's crazy. He uh, Talking about guys in their last 25 games, who was better than Michael Porter Jr.? Chris Paul was number 13 over that stretch. 17.5 points, 9.5 assists, 53% from the field. Uh, not quite Michael Porter 56, but uh, four boards, 92% at the free throw line. He's... Uh, I don't know. I'd say ageless, but at some point it's going to be there. And then the question, I guess, is how fast is there any kind of drop off? Okay. Who do you like? Who are some of the, the Brandon Day targets? It's funny. This is uh, a guy that I have never owned, and it's only been a couple of years, but I, I would like to get this year is Bam Adebayo. Same. Um, same, by the way. Go ahead, though. It, it just it seems like this is going to be, first of all, he does it all. And it's always nice you have a guy that can get you points, rebounds, assists, steals, blocks, field goal percentage, and doesn't kill your free throw percentage. It just feels like he's going to take even a bigger step than he did last year. So, I mean, he goes from 44 overall in 2019-20 to 19. Feels like he's a guy that could end up a Jason Tatum type thing that ends up being a first rounder when we're talking about first rounders next year. So, Bam is a guy that I would like to get. Can I, uh, and, and, you know, I think he falls also into one of the main things you and I talk about, which is he is arguably the toughest dude in the NBA. He only missed games last year because he was forced to. That's yeah, And COVID he went as far as anybody could go. He would he you know the Heat and the Lakers in the bubble finals, basically every other player on those two teams wound up like half deceased this last year and Bam still played what? 63 64 games. He almost made it through the whole damn season. Yeah. Yeah. It's those are all reasons why. And it just feels like this is slowly becoming his team um obviously jimmy butler's there but it feels like it's getting closer and closer to being his team and they want him to be the guy i don't disagree i i would love to see him take two more shots per game i don't think it's going to happen but i also don't really care that much because the floor is probably 30 for him which is a really really high floor and uh again like, he probably plays 75 or more out of 82 games this season. Yet 90% of a guy, if a guy plays 90% of his games, his totals rank is going to be so juicy. And you're a head-to-head -head guy, so you love dudes that don't give you zeros in the middle of a week. Yeah, exactly. And he went last year for 29. If he's not kept this year, I think I would go up to close to 40 for him. Hmm. Yeah, that means nothing to me. <laughs> yeah, fair. That's fair. How much you start with? 150? 
200. 200. All right. Well, there you go. Yeah, I need to get you and Eric Ong on a show where I just sit back and say, okay, guys, argue about auction leagues, and yeah. I'll just I'll just listen. And we may just need to get a damn auction show going at Hoop Ball, frankly. That's probably yeah. the answer. Who else Who else do you like? Uh, by the way, I keep, I keep calling you Brandon Day because just that one tweet that thought your last name was Day, and I'm just leaning into it real hard. Oh, that was amazing. That was I wonderful. Good, good times. Um, <laughs> and my next two are actually big men as well. And one guy I'm not going to get this year because I think he's going to be kept in my league. But you've heard me talk about him in the past. But it's Porzingis. I feel like he's got a point to prove this year. And I like guys that are motivated. And he just is someone that I feel like kind of goes under the radar for how good he is in fantasy. Last year, he was ranked in the top 25 in per game. He only played 43 games, and that's always the concern. But it's just what he gives you. I feel like he's going to need to be on the floor for Dallas to be successful this year. So I would like to get myself some Porzingis, if able. Damn it, we agree again. I want to find one where we disagree today. I- I'm with you on this. There's an episode of this show coming soon. I actually already recorded the segment with Matt Smith. He got Chris Stops in the, the mock draft that I had put together. And we talked about how... Uh, especially in a games cap roto format, which is sort of my preferred one. I don't care that much if he misses 13 or 14 games. I, I hope that nothing big happens. But one of the other things I talked about with Matt was, and, and Lord knows you were watching this series closely, he was horrible in the playoffs. And every minute he was horrible, I just kept thinking, awesome. He's going to get drafted later by like two slots for every game that he sucks in the playoffs. And he is, he's going... A fully healthy coming into this year, Chris Kristaps is getting drafted in the 40s, which is effectively two rounds back of what you just said his per game average has been pretty much any time he's been healthy and on the floor in his career, like maybe minus his rookie season. He's he's a tough pull in head to head though. I'm interested. I'm I'm curious to know why you're willing to take that plunge uh, when the zeros do hurt a bit more. Because I don't think there's gonna be as many as them this year. Oh, it go. just feels like he's. He's got an entire fan base that's really up his ass right now. And, <laughs> I mean, they all anticipate yep. him being dealt. They were like, all right, Luca needs somebody that's actually going to help him. Luca and, and KP don't get along. It's not going to work. And he was, I mean, played 57 games in 2019-20. He missed the year before that, played 48 games. The most games he's played is 72. Um, but it feels like this is a year that he can get up to close to 60-65. And if he's able to do that and you're able to get him where you said – then I'm willing to take that. By the way, I really like the Mavericks season win total over, which I think is 48 this year. Um, and they were basically on pace in last year's 10-game shortened season to be to have, I think, 47 if they kept up that same pace. And remember, they lost half of their team to COVID for like three weeks in uh, January or February. Remember that? Remember half the Mavs were just stuck in Denver for like a month last year? Yeah, it, I don't know. It feels like Luca's going to get even better, too. Uh-huh. I mean, just look what he did with Slovenia in, in the Olympics. Um, so it, it feels like he's a guy that can carry a team. But I, I don't know. I still don't love the Mavs. I feel like that conference is good. Um, but, I mean, you who, where do you think – who do you think finishes higher, the Clippers or the Mavs? I think it's pretty close. I think the Clippers' season win total is 45.5. I actually like that over, too. They feel like – an. it feels like – well, you, you follow the team. The vibe I'm getting is like the pre Kawhi Clippers where they just felt like it was us against the world and they just went out and won a crap ton of games because they played harder than everybody else. Yeah, exactly. It, it feels like that's going to happen. That's why I think the Clippers will probably finish higher than the Mavs, but yeah. we'll see. Um, so yeah, KP is definitely a guy that I would go in on. I feel like you're going to, you might agree on this one as well. Um, but uh, maybe I'll one, just, Dad. maybe I'll just fight you on the last one just for the hell of it. Who you got? You bet. And it's someone that's been hurt in the past, but it's someone that has been a, a top two, top two round guy is Nurkic. I, I just feel like he's someone that has a new coach in Chauncey Phillips. There's no more Cantor, and it felt like they were splitting time last year. He showed glimpses of how good he could be. Feels like with a full entire off season and getting more focus on him, I feel like Nurkic is a guy that I would like to target. And last year he finished outside the top 100. So he's someone that I don't know where he's going right now, but he's someone that I would happily target. Before I even answer you on Nurk, what are your feelings on Billups? Because wasn't he working with the Clippers broadcast team last year? 
No, he was he was the Clippers assistant. He went from being the Clippers broadcaster. That's, two that was two years, years ago. ago. Okay. Yeah, so he was the analyst with Brian Seaman, and then he went on the bench um, with Tyron Liu, and the guards raved about the work that he did with them, and everyone talked about how good of a coach he was, and he went over to, I believe, Ty Liu went to his place, or he went to Ty Liu's place for several months, and it seems like he's all in, and he knows what he's doing, and the players like him, so I think he's going to do decent with Portland, and I mean, obviously, it depends on Lillard and what happens there. But it, it seems like he knows what he's doing offensively. And he's played for some pretty good coaches in the past, George Carl obviously being one of them. So I think he'll do well. And, you know, he's Mr. Big Shot. So yeah. uh, Nurk's ADP this year is 65. You're making it really hard for me to pretend to argue with you on this one. That's uh, low, man. And that's really low. I know. I was hoping I would look it up and I would see like 45 and say, well, and then I could have argued that like there's a lot of ways this could go wrong. Nurk is often hurt, which is very much a thing. It's not just one year. It's happened a few times. But if he's really going in the 60s in like standard real people draft, by the way, his Yahoo pre-rank is 59. So I, I like it's not it doesn't look like that ADP is moving that much then damn it, I have to agree with you on this one, too. A couple of footnotes on Nurk. He didn't play a normal complement of minutes at all last year. Yep. Remember, he started the season uh, like violently out of shape. He had horrible family things going on in the offseason. I think he lost his grandma to COVID. He was back. He was in Europe for a while. He missed all of training camp. So he just wasn't right mentally or physically, got hurt, Lost his playing time to Ennis Cantor for pretty much the entire season, even once he was healthy, while he was kind of trying to get into shape. If you want to look at what Nurk can be, you actually have to look at the Blazers' playoff games last year as opposed to their regular season. He played, uh, I think he played 30-plus minutes in one regular season game late in the year. Maybe two were mixed in there. Okay, I can look this up. May 7th. He played 31 minutes, uh, and May 12th, he played 32 minutes. By the way, in that game, he had 11 points, 15 rebounds, 6 assists, 3 steals, and 4 blocks. <laughs> um, in the playoffs, he went 33, 25, 32, 27, 24, 33. So half of the games, he was over 30. And during the regular season, again, uh, it was like 4 the entire year. A couple at the very beginning, and a couple at the very end. So... No one really saw normal Nurk last year. And in the 60s, that is all upside. In the last five games of the regular season last year, he averaged about 26 minutes per ball game. By the way, I don't think he's getting a 30, so I should add that caveat. Uh, Larry Nance Jr. is out there. He's going to play power forward and center minutes. Portland doesn't want to run Nurk into the ground. But in 25 and a half minutes a game at the end of last season... Uh, he averaged 15 and 10 with three and a half combined defensive stats, four assists, 53% from the field, and an unseasonably low 55% at the free throw line, which probably trends back up towards 70. So you're talking about a guy with top 25 potential going in the 60s. You, I assume you you just kind of have to cross your fingers that he makes it through most of the year. I... I Brandon, you're surprising me with how many injury-prone guys you've thrown into the good, the the Santa's good list. It's just because of the value. I mean, guys that are not hurt right now, which is part of it. And you look at what Nurkic has done. I mean, overall, in that obviously it was nine games that he played in that, I believe it was the bubble season in 1920, he was ranked eight. I mean, the year before that, he played 72 games, and he was ranked 37 in 27.4 <laughs> minutes, which is certainly where he could be. <laughs> And you get 27.5 points per game, 10.5 rebounds, 3 assists, 1 steal, 1 half blocks, 51% shooting. I mean, that's certainly a guy that can end up being a top 30 guy that you can get in the sixth round. By the way, at one point during, I know this has nothing to do with anything, but at one point during that, you said, during the 1920 season, I thought, Yusuf Nurkic was around in 1920. Uh, I know you meant 2019, 2020, but yeah. I just... It set off the, does it sound like I'm on old-time radio? Uh, Adam West bit from Family Guy in my head, and I had a little giggle about it. Uh, yeah, I couldn't really fight with you. I mean, the only thing you can pick on any of those guys is the injury bug. You know, a, a, a catastrophic injury. 
unfortunately, for a lot of NBA players, is pretty random for Nurk, for Porzingis, maybe even more so. Like, you, they, they call Porzingis the unicorn. I think he's really more of a woolly mammoth. Like, there are parts of him that just won't survive, <laughs> like, genetically. He's too big for his limbs. And then with Nurk, yeah, I think he was just sort of out of shape. So that may have played a role in last year. If yeah. If those guys don't get badly hurt, if it's just the nagging injuries where it's two games here, two games there, and it's a dozen over the course of a year, they just obliterate their ADPs because there's just no way their per game rank, there's no way their per game rank is going to be lower than where they're getting drafted. Yeah, and it's the value. That's the reason why. It's just you're getting good value. You're getting guys that can be top 24 guys way later than that, and that's the reason why I like them. And I wouldn't go for many of them, I I mean, I have Jason Tatum, so I have the stability there. So I I would take a risk or two when you, especially if you're in a uh, keeper league or an auction league, where you're able to get guys later on. Um, You can take a risk or two, and those are the guys that I'd certainly take a risk on. Yeah, you mentioned Tatum, and then you mentioned Bam. If you've got those two guys as your one and two, even if they don't beat their per game draft slot, they're probably playing, you know, seventy six and seventy eight games this year, respectively, which. That's a lot of production out of your top two guys. You know what this discussion reminds me of, Brandon, is uh, Chris Paul after Houston, which was, yep. it's that same kind of thing where, like, he's going around 40, 35 to 40 range in Oklahoma City, and I kept scratching my head, like, he only needs to play, like, 62 games this year to beat that by totals because his per game was not going to be any worse than top 20. And yeah. it, it's similar. I mean, these two guys are not first rounders the way Paul had been in the past. But Porzingis, he's he's never below twenty two really on a per game basis. Nurk, lately, I know earlier in his career he didn't have all the other stuff together, but lately when he's been healthy and in shape, he's really never been behind like top forty. So the fact that those two guys, KP and Nurk, are getting drafted two rounds back of that, it's you just have so much wiggle room for things to go wrong. If if Nurk only plays 55 games this year, yeah, it's a loss, but it's actually only kind of a small loss <laughs> at 65. Um, so yeah, I agree with you. I'm I'm with you on, I think, almost everything we talked about today. I probably just adjust Bradley Beal maybe a little less than you do. That might be the only spot we didn't have full alignment here. We'll argue more next time. Yeah, give me some more stuff to argue about. Hey, uh, can we do this again soon? Yeah, I'm available Fridays now, so we'll make it work. Hot diggity dog. Uh, Brandon Marcus, congratulations, Pops. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. And for everybody that's uh, listening, you enjoy Clippers basketball, feel free to hit up the Hoopball Clippers podcast as well. You the, should. Uh, the more listeners, the better. At Hoopball Clips on Twitter. That's the Clippers feed. At BD Marcus on Twitter. That's Brandon's feed. Brandon Marcus, not Brandon Day, but today is Brandon Day. So I bid you adieu with the same way we say hello. Happy Brandon Day. Happy Brandon Day. The Venerable B.D. Marcus on Twitter, my buddy. His last name is Marcus. Uh, uh, I I know that the person that did it is probably feeling embarrassed, but we actually really loved that someone thought his last name was Day because we kept saying Happy Brandon Day, but it was really, we were treating it like a day of the week. Any day of the week is Brandon Day if we get to talk to Brandon. He and I go go way back, by the way. We're uh, broadcasters of college and minor league baseball and yeah it's just it's just it's fun to talk to an old buddy and he does incredible work on the la clippers podcast here at hoopball clips honestly like he could be in arena right now if he wanted to i just i you know he just had a baby so probably doesn't have the time his last episode he talked to the clippers play-by-play guy noah eagle maybe the best guest pulls that i've seen on a podcast really good show Really good shows all the way around from Brandon. Okay, folks, thanks for listening to our first special weekend episode. We'll have another one for you tomorrow. I'm debating the order of things. I'll be talking to Adam Stock at about noon Pacific tomorrow, Sunday. So in all likelihood, that will probably be the episode you get tomorrow. But I'm also recording tomorrow evening with uh, Mike Barner. Um... And I need to get in rounds 7 and 8 of our mock draft, 9 and 10 at some point. And then Monday, 
We're talking to Jonas Nader, Alex Ricklein. I'll be joining... I, I, don't, I don't know if I can tease this yet, so I'll wait and I'll tease this thing, but I may be involved in perhaps the coolest thing, one of the coolest things that I've done since getting into this fantasy business. Like a, It's a moment where I feel like the fantasy bigwigs recognized me and I just... Like, I'm th- over the moon at this. Just, I know you guys listen to me and you're like, oh, Dan, he's like niche famous. I, I got to promise you guys, I'm still starstruck at some of the people that I get to talk to and hang out with because they're the same people that you and I, we all read when we were playing fantasy 20 years ago. And now they're guesting on the pot. This is amazing. And so then they're now inviting me back to do stuff and it's it's just too damn cool. Uh, so again, talking to Jonas Rickling on Monday, Matt Lawson on Tuesday. Uh, I believe we're talking to uh, our old buddy Josh Millman, who wasn't in the mock draft. That's probably on Tuesday. Well, uh, we talked about his, the old man report last time. I think we'll get into some of his favorites. Josh Lloyd next week, Dr. A and Brew combo show next week. I mean, this is... And I'm also, by the way, I'm keeping a, a running notepad document of all of the folks that have come on this show, their, uh, their favorites so far so i'll be able to hopefully compile those at some point towards the end of the thing have a great saturday everybody again i'll talk to you tomorrow i guess i can just say that at the end of every show right now again i'm at dan Baspers. please do drop me a follow d-a-n-b-e-s-b-r-i-s this is fantasy nba today a hoop ball presentation welcome back to the show manscaped.com go to manscaped.com use coupon code hoopball 20 and get 20 percent off and free shipping on your order Perfect time to do it right now. Now that they've re-upped with us, this is when we need you guys to go buy a couple of things. That'll keep them around longer term. Coupon code will work longer. They send us swag. Maybe we can even auction some of that stuff off. Or not auction, but uh, raffle. Raffle. That's the word. Raffle some of that stuff off. I don't know. But we need your help. Go check them out. Go get something. They've got some uh, really fancy stuff. They've also got a lot of really affordable stuff as well. So cool things over there. Uh, Again, thank you to Manscaped for jumping back on board. Have a great Saturday, everybody. We'll talk at you, with you, to you tomorrow. So long. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.